You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is 2722. Well, many of you out there I know have been fearful, afraid of inflation because you see, you go to the supermarket, you go to the store, wherever you're going, whatever you're buying, you are seeing the prices go higher and higher and higher. And well, on the one hand, it seems like a very risky time, and it certainly is. On the other hand, as the Chinese say, uh, the Chinese character for crisis consists of two characters. One is danger and the other is opportunity. Somebody who's been mastering opportunities at an incredible rate, incredible rate is Jewel Tankard. You find Jewel at jeweltankard.com. That's J E W E L T A N K A R D. Jewel, it's really an honor to have you on the show. You have uh, been uh, crushing it recently, and that's obvious that inflation doesn't have you down. No, not at all, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. No, actually, in times of financial crisis, recession or depression, um, that's when there's a huge, you know, the biggest opportunity. We see that with the Rockefellers. I've studied their blueprint, specifically going to Newport. But um, yeah, that's a time where there's tons of opportunity. And that's why there's, you know, podcasts like yours where people can get educated and ask questions and figure it out. But I've learned everyone is not hurting. There's some people that become very, very wealthy. Uh, during times of financial crisis. And I want everybody to know that. In any time of economic crisis, there are always winners and there are losers. And whether you're a winner or a loser is in large measure up to you. Now, in the recent global health crisis, all right, I think uh, many of you out there were losers, but just looking at uh, big pharma, big uh, medical industrial complex, doctors, uh, they were all winners, as well as many other sectors. If you were in real estate over the past two years, you clean clock. So <laughs> if that isn't proof, Jewel, that the opportunities are always out there for a waiting mind, what is? Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a huge opportunity. It was a great opportunity for me. Um, I know I went into the market and got involved uh, really heavily invested in the city of Detroit in the inner city and bought a ton of properties up there probably about six years ago. I've recently li liquidated because why? The market is in my favor. You know what I mean? I was able to really, really make. So I think people have to understand entry into any market and then exit is important. It's not just about, oh, I did this in terms of accumulating assets or change the way I did something. Things are always changing. So you have to really pay attention to that. I think that in every season, um, how you move, you probably have to edit a little bit more. And if you don't, you know, you know, make those edits and make those changes. This is when you start to see a lot of times people feel like, you know, times are hard, kind of like that book, Who Moved My Cheese, because it worked five years ago, but it's not necessarily running the same play today. Well, in real estate, there's a saying, and there's a lot of sayings on Wall Street all over. And the reason why you keep listening to them is because they are true. In real estate, the old saying is, you make money when you buy. You don't really make it when you sell, you make it when you buy. You agree with that? Um, no, not necessarily. I think that you it's depending on when you buy. You know, I wouldn't recommend somebody buying right now because it's a seller's market, right? Um, and so you don't want to buy high. You want to you want to buy low and you want to sell high. But a lot of times people get that like mix up. You know what I mean? You you buy, you don't buy high. So I wouldn't recommend unless someone just had to buy a property. I was blessed when it was really a buyer's market because and then I was 
you know, buying up all these properties in Detroit. And now I've sold, um, you know, I've liquidated a lot of them and now I'm moving into digital property, um, which is in the metaverse and then also digital assets with cryptocurrency. And so right now in the metaverse, which um, you probably know, Mark Zuckerberg made that announcement, changing Facebook to meta. And now there are all these properties, like it's a whole world in the metaverse. I remember when I got my Oculus and I put it on uh. and I'm walking around and I'm seeing the weed district, the gay district, the political district, the fashion district. And I'm like, where'd you guys come from? <laughs> but, you know, anytime you can get in a particular industry first, then that's when you're probably going to make the most amount of money. So I think it's, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it's about timing, knowing where the markets are. Well, that is the point. Like if you buy a fully valued property, when you buy it, just like if you buy a fully valued stock or an overpriced crypto, when you buy it, you kind of locked in your loss. When you buy it undervalued, that's where you lock in your profit. Uh, I've seen it numerous times, but especially in real estate where the owner doesn't realize the full potential of the property or realizes it, but isn't in a position to exploit it or isn't in a position, doesn't have the money to do it. And, or is, has other things they want to do and they just can't be bothered. And then that creates an opportunity. So hey, getting to cryptos, digital assets, I know what you're talking about. My son got an Oculus for uh, Christmas and uh, he kind of spun around the uh, house half nauseous for like a week and he put it up on the uh, TV and I'm watching it and I'm like, well, I guess there's something to it here, but maybe that's a little too deep a rabbit hole for me. Uh, how do you make money in the metaverse? Well, you know, um, and I'm I'm still learning as it's all new for all of us. But um, I think the biggest way that you make money is find out where projects are happening um, within the metaverse. For example, I am um, co-owner of a virtual casino there and I bought something called a gambling ape, which is in, which is an NFT. Um, an NFT is uh, basically it's in the crypto realm and you can buy a particular time in history. You can, it can an NFT can be a video, 15 seconds of, you know, Kevin Durant doing a three point layup. It could be uh, a collector's item picture that somebody, anything that basically people would, can, would deem valuable for whatever reason can be an NFT. And then you put it on OpenSea and you have these bidding wars and people are buying and selling. And so I found out um, through the educational curriculum that I'm a part of that I needed to buy a gambling ape if I wanted to be a co-owner of a virtual casino that is anticipated to make billions of dollars, by the way, Carrie, I was like, wow. And I'll be a co-owner in that, but they only have so many. So unlike the money supply where it's unlimited, so to speak, because the feds can just go in the back and decide, hey, we're going to print more money uh, in the world of crypto or NFTs or whatever. You're, there are no unlimited. There's only a limited amount. And of course, as people start to buy it because they deem it valuable, it drives the price up. So the idea with the metaverse is to buy property in areas where you know that there's going to be major development, whether it's a casino or whether it's a restaurant or whether it's a you know fashion district where they're going to be clothes that are brought on by top designers like Louis Vuitton and Gucci. And then when you buy and you buy property in that area, you can buy storefronts or penthouses or apartment buildings, or you can just do a whole floor. Um, right now, they don't have it where you can convert your property into cash. You just use something called MetaCoins. But the whole idea is that they're going to be releasing soon um, where you can actually convert your MetaCoins to cash. What a big Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, well, I've heard about these NFTs. I have a theory about them, Jewel. I oh, believe, really? Yeah, I believe that in the future, you're not going to own. I, I should say this. You'll own stuff, but your proof of ownership will exist strictly in an NFT. There won't be titles to property. There won't be auto titles, anything else. You'll have an NFT. The title will be assumed in that NFT. Mm. So basically, it will become the universal form of, in Currency. All, we would call it evidence of ownership. It will be the okay. ultimate because your title to the house it's filed in the county clerk's office to your property, whatever it is, but uh, it's, it's merely evidence that you own it. Uh, and it might be deemed proof that you own it, 
But yeah. when you own everything in NFTs, the NFT will be the evidence, will be the proof, and any liens and encumbrances will be subsumed in other NFTs that are connected to your NFT. So all ownership will be done by NFTs, all current forms of ownership other than possession, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law. But whether you're buying securities, whether you're buying airplanes, cars, uh, real estate, uh, you name it, mm -hmm. NFTs will become the ultimate form of ownership. Mm. And, uh, maybe they'll be in the metaverse too. I don't yeah. know. You know what yeah. bothers me about the metaverse? It sounds too much like, uh, like the matrix, you know? Uh, you're there with these goggles on, You've yeah. lost consciousness of your true being and all your energy is being sucked out to support the metaverse. I don't know. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm carrying it a little too far, but it just uh, it seems to concern me. Yeah, I mean, it's it's new. It's new. It's different. And I think that uh, and I think that's why a lot of times with people. You know, and that's why I try to just keep learning new stuff, keep learning new stuff, keep learning new stuff. Because the reality is how we did business 10 years ago, how we did business five years ago, it's so different. And even in this digital space, I would say probably you have a lot of like 18 to 35 year olds that are in crypto. But I'm encouraging every generation to get involved because I think crypto and NFTs are the future of currency and the future of banking. I think that we finally, this bubble that is going to pop, I think it's going to finally pop. And I think uh, when the dust lands, people that are owners of cryptocurrency and NFTs, if they have the right ones, are going to be, you know, the ones that are the next multiple millionaires and billionaires of the world. I mean, just look at it. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence that you have people like, you know, the Winklevoss twins who are heavily involved in in crypto, Michael Saylor, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, Elon Musk, you can kind of just follow the footprints of the wealthy and see, I think it's here to stay. Well, I think you raise a really good point, And that is there is a bubble bursting in your future, whether you're it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, whether you're like cleaning the floors at the uh, local airport or you're a multi-zillionaire real estate owner, the bubble's going to pop. What do you think yeah. the world's going to look like after and the, the bubble could be construed as the U.S. dollar or government debt or take your pick? We got all these bubbles all over the place. And yeah. When one goes, they kind of all go. What's the world look like after that? Don't just survive. Thrive, the Financial Survival Network. Osino Resources is a Ross Beattie backed gold exploration company in mining friendly Namibia. Osino's district scale land package is situated near two producing gold mines, one of which Osino's management team previously developed and sold to B2 Gold. Osino's founders and management are experienced mining professionals who have already successfully developed and sold two companies in the past seven years. Osino has a tight share structure, and with its current treasury, it can self fund the advancement of its gold discovery into at least. 2022. This is an exploration company with drills turning that you'll definitely want to pay attention to. Osino trades in New York under the ticker OSIIF and in Toronto under the ticker OSI. To learn more, go to OsinoResources.com. That's OsinoResources.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Yeah, I know. That's so funny. We're figuring that out. Right. I mean, I, I know that I think that um, the way that kind of the old rules of money, I would call them were gold and silver and physical real estate um, and stocks and bonds and CDs. But I think the new rules of money are now more, you know, in the crypto NFT digital property um, world. And I think that um, I think that they're the middle class, I think, is going to get hurt really bad uh, because they're the ones that experience the biggest loss when all of a sudden their income is lost or even we're seeing it now with jobs. Right. I mean, you know, less and less labor fields are needed. Like if you're not in some sort of tech, stem cell, artificial intelligence, um, I don't know how much there'll be a need for you. So I think that we're pushing our you to get into coding and stem cell and anything that's technological um, has a foundational base. I think everything else, I don't think the dollar will ever be obsolete, uh, but I think the value of the dollar will be so low that you're not going to want to use it for anything. And for those that are owners of what we call um, hodlers, people that hold on to their Bitcoin and Ethereum, those are the two main cryptocurrencies that I recommend that people never liquidate. They're going to be able to leverage it and get cash 
And, you know, I mean, now people are using Bitcoin to buy property and you can go to Starbucks and buy coffee with Bitcoin or Home Depot and buy supplies with Bitcoin. So I think that the, those that own crypto will be doing those will be the next wave of multiple millionaires and billionaires. And I think the guys that stayed in real estate with tons and tons of real estate are going to be in trouble because now the laws are basically in favor of the tenants. I have tenants literally right now that have been paid rent in two years. And the government is saying that there's a governmental agency called CERA. And they're saying, hey, we're going to pay you all these guys back rent, which is great. But the reality is <laughs> I still had to pay homeowners. I still had to pay property taxes. I still had to pay contractors to go over and fix roofs, leaky roofs. So my expenses didn't stop because COVID. So um, that's what was one of my reasons for liquidating my property. I could see the changes. I saw the laws and I'm looking at my balance sheet and I'm saying I made 12% for the year with real estate, but 12% a week for crypto. So you tell me which one is better, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to have a stomach for volatility. Just a couple of weeks ago, crypto, what did it go down to? 28,000? Uh, it was right at about 30, but it's now up, up to 44. 44. Yeah, I know. I know. And it's It's got a new bottom, though. You know, it had to get it found a new support where the support, you know, a year and a half ago was 3,500. That's when I started buying it. And then it came up to 20 and then it dropped back down to 10. And so I, I don't think we'll see it ever go below 20,000 again. It's an ugly looking chart, even though it's going higher now. When you look the one year chart and you see the double top put in, but uh, that's where being a trader really can come in handy. The key is to uh, buy the stuff when it's cheap and sell it when it's uh, high and keep doing that if you can trade. But yeah. you know, many of you out there like myself, not the most effective traders. Hey, so if there's one thing you've done in your past, Jewel, that laid the groundwork for your current success, what would you attribute that to? Um, I am a student always. Like, it doesn't matter that, you know, um, you know, it doesn't matter that, you know, 10 years ago I was doing this or five years ago I was doing this. The world is changing very rapidly. And so I think that we have to really stay open and I've stayed very open to listen to other ideas about money and its patterns and its rhythms, because I think that there's a lot of stuff that worked for my grandparents and my parents that if I did that, I might not ever become, you know, I may never broke that. I may never break, have broken the 10 million mark or the 15 million mark. I think that it's in the change in learning new things like crypto and NFTs. I think it's the future. And I know for some people they're resistant because it's so different, but I promise you, if you get involved and get engaged, uh, it won't, it'll be the hardest is going to be in the beginning. Once you get past that, you'll be great. Interesting. So being a lifelong learner, obviously yeah. is crucial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Myself, I feel the same way and uh, resisted the cryptos. I got a small crypto exposure, but I keep accumulating whether it goes up or down and right. no bet. complaints. But, yeah. but uh, my biggest failing as an investor has, and it's worked sometimes, but when I've really lost, it's that I didn't know when to get out. That's it. That is so, I'm so glad you said that, Carrie. Everything is about entering the market and exiting the market. You know, we've created a really phenomenal community uh, for people to come in and ask questions. Uh, for example, I accumulate silver. I'm on an auto save program where I get, you know, 20 ounces of silver every month. But at the end of last year, I cashed it all in and moved it over to Bitcoin. You know, and so it wasn't about me just holding the silver forever, um, even though there are other guys out there who probably tell you, you know, hold it. You know, um, some of I consider mentors, Mike Maloney and those guys in, in the commodity world. But wow. I, I, when I look at everything, because I, I, at the end of the day, I'm going to look at my bottom line numbers. Where was my profit? Was there a profit here? Did this make sense? Do I need to run this? For example, as some Airbnbs, they were doing great. But since COVID has happened. Now I'm liquidating those because people aren't traveling as much. I think at some point they probably will. But in the meantime, <laughs> in the meet between time, I'm going to I'm going to liquidate. So uh, Florida, we haven't had those issues. Everybody's coming here. So uh, I tell people buy real estate and if you can manage it closely, turn them into Airbnbs. 
assuming yeah. that the uh, regulations and all that in your area permit, because at the same time, people aren't traveling. They are traveling a lot, and the cost of hotels has skyrocketed. You know, a, a three star in Miami on your average weekend you used to be able to find it one fifty to two hundred. Now it's three fifty to five hundred, and so people are going to are going to Airbnbs because and you get to the hotel jewel. Then there's a resort fee, and then they nickel and dime you. God forbid you order a soda from room service, it'll cost you like fifty dollars. They've gone exactly. totally out off the chain, out of control. Mm -hmm. So still could be good, uh, but. Yeah. Flex. I like your approach because it's it shows flexibility. So, yeah. all right, I made my money. Now it's on to the next. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to do that. I think when you look at kind of like you know, Netflix reached out to Blockbuster and said, "Hey guys, we're going to start digital streaming. We would love to have you guys come and you know partner with us." Blockbuster wasn't interested because they were the biggest and the baddest. Now they're antiquated. They're out of business. And so I think I've seen a lot of big business turn into mom and pop because they did not know how to edit and pivot and they were afraid of the change. So I think that you have to tell yourself, like, listen, if I'm going to be in this for like the long game, just because this is the way we do it now does not mean that we're going to do it this way all the time. I mean, there was a time everybody had cable. Probably I would say I think they said 80 percent of the homes no longer have cable because of things like Netflix and Hulu and, you know, Prime Amazon. So yeah. I think everyone has to have a mindset if you're going to be a long term investor, long term entrepreneur that is successful. You have to take on that mindset. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki and Donald Trump wrote a book called The Midas Touch, Why Most Entrepreneurs Will Never Become Wealthy. And I thought that was really a phenomenal book. And they basically talked about most entrepreneurs just once they find something they like, <laughs> they just don't have the foresight to say, hey, things are kind of changing. This is not going to work anymore if we do it this way. And they become a mom and pop or antiquated altogether. I just remember talking about missed opportunities. The biggest one I ever saw, I wasn't part of, aside from not buying Bitcoin. Uh, there was a company called Data Ease. Actually, it was owned by another company, but that was their application. It was a DOS-based database manager, and they were approached by Microsoft. And Microsoft offered them, uh, I think, either 12.5% of the company or 13.5% of the company for this program, which had a lot of bugs. It was less than perfect. And they uh, they turned them down. And now nobody's ever heard of uh, data ease. Microsoft's worth, you know, over a trillion dollars and, you know, hundreds of billions in cash. So uh, by not having an open mind, you miss opportunities. Obviously, you're going to fail. Uh, what's the what's the biggest fail you ever had, Jewel? Um, let me see. The biggest failure that I've ever had, probably letting someone else trade my money for me. <laughs> that, <can happen. laughs> that forced me to educate myself and learn because that was a catastrophe. And I tried it several times and it was like, girl, like you need to learn how to do this yourself. <laughs> so I was, I failure, failure is the best teacher for sure. But yeah. uh, as the saying goes, uh, a smart man, can learn from his own mistakes, but a truly wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So Jewel, people want to connect with you on the web. Uh, however, whatever platform, how do they do it? Yeah, they can get on jeweltankert.com. Um, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook is all Jewel Tanker. All right. Excellent. And if you got a question for Jewel, you can always shoot me an email to kl at .com and we'll get you an answer. Don't forget, go over to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Get your free newsletter. Jewel, been a total pleasure. We will definitely have you back. Thank you. I appreciate it, Carrie. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.